Yes, look, one man, one man really well. Uh, good, it's nice, isn't it? It's just been the interval. That's fun. You look grumpy at the back, just oh, I'm not happy. Um, I'm Ben Shannon. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm a Liverpool fan. Don't touch your groin, that was weird then. <laughs> I mean, you, went, you went, I do enjoy this character already. Just went straight forward. <laughs> you like them, don't you? I don't know why I've tried to warn them that. Just for you. Just it's bright colours, isn't it? Um, I'm 19. I'm 19. You might be a bit surprised. I've got a bit of a beard going on, but yeah, I'm only 19. Uh, I'm not from round here as well. Everyone in here knows each other tonight. This is weird. Literally, is there anyone who's here for the first time in, in Mansfield? You're here for the first time in Mansfield? No, you're not, sir. Uh, here, here, yeah. But I've never been in, in, in Mansfield before, um, so it's just hard coming here. And I live in a place called Rossington, kind of uh, nearby, but in the term, I live in a place called Southampton. Has anyone ever been to Southampton at all? Yeah. 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 It is, it is, it, look at you in your country ways. It's near fucking London, isn't it? <laughs> They've got wheelbarrows with engines down there. It's brilliant. We call them cars. No, um... um final question. Uh, what is your proudest moment on stage? Proudest moment on stage? Oh, see the problem is, my gigs blur when I come off the stage. Um... Oh, I think my proudest moment on stage was meant when I made, um... No, no, that wasn't it. I think one of my proudest moments was when, it's just when the audience gets involved, like they get behind you. And I suppose the best example of that is like my first ever gig, like I wrote the tune in the car on the way there and I just didn't know what I was doing and I just got on stage and I just went for it. And um, I was doing a story about riding my moped, um, but I was saying it's not a moped, it's a scooter. And my friend just randomly shouted like moped wanker and for you know the in-betweeners thing and the whole audience got behind me in the story and I was like telling the story about how I was like you know going really hard on my bike and they were probably like cheering me along. I think that's my proudest moment when they just got behind the story and just really loved it. My best gig was probably that one or when I did when I did a musical in sixth form because I can't sing and I'm not the best dancer. But the fact I got the courage to do it, and it was in front of like loads of people, we did like three nights, and like I, used to, I went to like this huge, like secondary school. So the fact that I did that, I was proud that I did that because that was one of the things that I did, and my best gig. I did a gig at the stay awake at my college, and we had this annoying little uh, head of year, Miss Niazi, who was this short Asian bloke with a Birmingham accent. She used to go, you know, she had this weird accent, and basically. I was, I went on to my gym gag and then she basically heckled me on stage and she said, oh, um, oh, you need to stop doing the weights because I think you're eating the weights or something. And then everyone went, ooh, and then basically I took off her accent on stage and I completely ruined her. I think that was my proudest moment on stage. It was, um something that happened during the show uh, somebody was racist and then I did something which was the punchline was and that was a little bit racist and then people laughed and I said then again what's just been on and then everyone remembered the person that's been on and I got a round of applause it doesn't seem like much but the fact that I got a round of applause meant a lot and hopefully it won't be the last that was <laughs> wasn't it? yeah it was <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said person, I don't want to... <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> One sort of, that first gig that I ever had, the worst gig that I've ever had, that's probably one of my proudest, not because it, not the fact that it went well, but because I actually got up and done it. I was so terrified of doing it, and I so could have easily just ran out of there, you know, quit the course and not done it, but I did get up and do it, and... <laughs> that was a complete failure. The fact that I got up and done it really sort of said, yeah, you can do this now. And then I suppose that it just, but on a general sort of high point, doing that gig for the Chortle Heat, that was, that was the best I've ever done it and probably the best response I've ever had. So that was definitely the highest point for me. So the, the very first gong show, which was at a place called The Soul Cellar, um, the reason why I did well, and I wasn't expecting to, because it was, as I mentioned before, a very hostile crowd, and I came off, uh, well I didn't even come off, I was the last act on, 
so I stayed on um, the stage and all the other acts come on and then it was a clap off and then somebody else won it but I, I didn't care because I'd, I'd achieved what I said I wanted to achieve and then the next time I went into uh, The Hobbit which is uh, a pub that we drink in just in case people don't know um, I had people coming up to me and saying oh you're that guy and for a minute it was like being famous it was like wow this is really odd because I've obviously never had that before you know but not only were they saying that I saw you they were saying that was really good um, and when you hear it from one person, you just kind of go, all right, thanks. When you start hearing it from about five to ten people from different parts of the room, you start kind of going, right, okay. The, the first gig I did uh, Soul Sound in September, just getting like, uh, even then I, I started off like really shouty uh, compared to what I am now. It's just, just knowing that I could get up there and do it and just the absolute uh, uh, thrill and just exhilaration that you get from doing it when you get like like an applause break or something like that and just sort of blows your mind how good what a good feeling it is to be on stage and uh, you would do a play called Five Kinds of Silence and even though I was a, a main character I sort of had to do like supporting roles and stuff like that and um, I had to and the main character is a character called Billy who was abused as a child and I had to, uh, during a flashback sequence that he had so I had to play his dad um, and during that I had to get out of my comfort zone and be sort of quite vicious um, towards him and literally sort of shout in this guy's ear. Uh, it's being very sort of domineering. It was very, and that was, that was good for me because I had people come up to me after and said, well, I've never seen you sort of like that before. I once pulled the muscle in my own arm trying to moisturise my face. <laughs> now, moisturising is considered uh, weak and immoral as it is, but imagine physically injuring yourself with a quest for smooth skin. <laughs> now, I can't even lick the lid of life without getting yoghurt on my chin. <laughs> now, but I can't even do cool, I can't even do things that seem cool, but aren't. For example, look like I had a wild night when I turned up to football training with carpet burns on my knees. What was you up to last night, Baxter? I was running around on my knees pretending to be a dwarf to scare my dad. <laughs> and it worked. You know, so what I do as a kid to try and up my coolness, I decided to do karate. Or karate to the martial artist in the room. Now, the reason behind that is I thought, if I'm not cool enough to pull the bitches, I can twat the people who are cool enough to pull the bitches. But as it turns out, you need more than two classes to do that. Um, as I found out, you can't do much ass kicking with a white belt. <laughs> In fairness though, you know, I, did, I went, did go to two rather than one. If I only went to one, I would literally only know how to bow at an oncoming attacker. <laughs> Give us your wallet, mate. I can't take it <laughs> Bit racist, but then again, what's just been on? <laughs> I think any time that people laugh, is like a little proud, proud moment. Um, so I haven't really done anything that spectacular yet. I'm always quite meticulous with my set, so I don't really do any improv. Um, but yeah, I think any time that a joke goes down well, I think that's a tiny little proud moment. <laughs> I opened for Tony Law once. Um, not like on a tour or anything, but in a club. I was the one that opened for him. And it was just me and him in the last section. And um, I came off, and the MC, it's called Sean McLaughlin, and he's doing all right for himself. He's not famous, but he's, he's doing all right for himself. He said, oh, yeah, that was really good. I liked that guy. And then uh, when I came off, Tony Law just sort of shook my hand and went like, oh, that was, re that was really good, and uh, in his Canadian voice with his beard and stuff. And um, I've since realised, telling people that I opened for Tony Law, that he's not actually as famous as I thought he was. But he's a, he's a man that I've always thought was hilarious, and um, I think that was my proudest moment, because I really slapped the arse of that gig, that went really well. And to have done it in front of someone that I really admire, comedy-wise, and for him to acknowledge that, uh, you know, I did well. I went on stage, and I cut my set halfway through, and I said, hang on a minute, this is what I want to say. And I went on one about how I was better in bed, and he was a complete tool, and things like that. And I felt like I got everything off my chest about how much of a complete and utter prick he was. And everyone sort of... I, I was scared that people were going to be like, oh, this isn't funny, this is him just venting. So when everyone sort of cheered and clapped and laughed, that was like, 
I knew that he was going to watch that, which he did eventually. I was told that he did watch that, and apparently he didn't find it very impressive. But everyone in that room was laughing at one person who I consider to be a complete and utter bully. And I think any bully should have that time where they are laughed at for the lack of person that they are. Telling my joke about um, uh, my friend Pete who had a cliché overdose. Um, and it wasn't a very funny joke, but people got it and they laughed a lot. And I got so excited about the fact that that joke had landed, I actually um, uh, pronounced, yeah, my, my mother hated that joke. I said, fuck you, bitch, it works, quite loudly. I was quite happy. In comedy, it would be my chortle heat because it's the best gig I've ever done. It, I realised while I was up there, like, it actually formed whilst I was performing and I started to really realise the persona and the direction I wanted to take and it just happened through pure chance. As I was saying words, my brain started to say them differently to how I'd rehearsed them and it kind of formed a persona. It was a Newbury, it was a Newbury comedy festival, which doesn't strike me as a particularly national event. Um, uh, but we ended up winning this whole comedy competition. I remember like, my parents had come to see it and a few of my friends and we, we, we thought we weren't going to win at all. Because um, it was meant to be about 10 minutes long, it was actually about, we ended up going off about 25 minutes, but only doing about 5 minutes of our script, and it completely outlived lived the rest of it. And we won, um, in front of a, there was the biggest audience I've ever performed in front of, it was about 500 people. That was my prior to when they read out the envelope, where is Jake Bookenberg and Alexander Quayle? But, um, <laughs> there were complete dickheads about it as well. Because um, I, I, when he pulled the thing out of the envelope to read it, I could see it over his shoulder, so it wasn't actually a surprise to me as it was. Honestly, everyone was like, yeah, we won, I could go. And so we were up there, like, Jacob Cooper and Alexander Quayle. Up we stood and we were like, yeah, no big deal. So, yeah, that getting through that gong show when I was one kid, like, actually getting to the end of it, I was like, no way. Because I had nothing, I had no material. I just got drunk and made a bet that I'll do it, and then I did. And I actually got through. I was like, wow, maybe I can wing things a lot better than I thought. So yeah, that was a proud moment. Worst gig, but proud moment. <laughs> my favourite story I do is my duck story. So, um, in fact, I've done that three times now, and it's worked three times. Um, and it's one of the funniest and craziest moments of my life. And that's, that leads back to f doing, I like, I'm better when I, it's real, if you know what I mean. Because that really what did happen. And it really was one of the most craziest, I can convert it and it's and I've yeah so that's probably the proudest the duck story I love them ducks now <laughs> I read an article in the, climate change, uh, in the Guardian recently that climate change in five years time will be totally irreversible I thought that's awful I thought I really need to get that some more press coverage so I decided to get the concept of climate change to have a very secret long-winded yet obvious affair with Ryan Giggs <laughs> <laughs> Should have done that joke a year ago when it was topical. <laughs> Speaking of wankers, um, I used to see this thing in the news with John Terry. Uh, apparently John Terry uh, has... I mean, I don't really follow football that much, but... John Terry has been accused of calling Anton Ferdinand a black cunt. Now, whatever you think of John Terry, like, people make mistakes, and it's quite obvious that the biggest mistake made by anyone who was why, uh, by Anton Ferdinand for not smashing his stupid face into the floor. <laughs> And I read an article as well in The Guardian, the same, same paper, that uh, Jesus, when he was younger, tried to organise a five-a-side football team. <laughs> uh, this is definitely true. And there was this little Roman guy who wanted to play, and he was like, oh, Jesus, can I play? Oh, no. um, and Jesus wouldn't let him play. But I mean, whatever you think of Jesus, everybody makes mistakes. But I think the biggest mistake made by anybody was by the little Roman kid for not smashing his stupid face into the floor. <laughs> I should have that joke 2,000 years ago when I was talking about it. <laughs>